be reading from the book of 2 Kings, chapter 5, verses 1 to 14. And as you're looking that up, I just want to say thank you to Marge. Our organist, music director, is on vacation this week. Marge, thank you for accompanying our service today. 2 Kings, chapter 5. Let us hear God's word. Now Naaman was commander of the army of the king of Aram. He was a great man in the sight of his master and highly regarded, because through him the Lord had given victory to Aram. He was a valiant soldier, but he had leprosy. Now bands from Aram had gone out and had taken captive a young girl from Israel, and she served Naaman's wife. She said to her mistress, If only my master would see the prophet who was in Samaria, he would cure him of his leprosy. Naaman went to his master and told him what the girl from Israel had said. By all means, go, the king of Aram replied. I will send a letter to the king of Israel. So Naaman left, taking with him ten talents of silver, six thousand shekels of gold, and ten sets of clothing. The letter that he took to the king of Israel read, With this letter I am sending my servant Naaman to you, so that you may cure him of his leprosy. As soon as the king of Israel read the letter, he tore his robes and said, Am I God? Can I kill and bring back to life? Why does his fellow send someone to me to be cured of his leprosy? See how he's trying to pick a quarrel with me. When Elisha, the man of God, heard that the king of Israel had torn his robes, he sent him this message. Why have you torn your robes? Have the man come to me, and he will know that there is a prophet in Israel. So Naaman went with his horses and chariots and stopped at the door of Elisha's house. Elisha sent a messenger to to say to him, Go, wash yourself seven times in the Jordan, and your flesh will be restored and you will be cleansed. But Naaman went away angry and said, I thought that he would surely come out to me and stand and call in the name of the Lord his God, wave his hand over the spot, and cure me of my leprosy. Are not Abana and Farpar, the rivers of Damascus, better than any of the waters of Israel? Couldn't I wash in them and be cleansed? So he turned and went off in a rage. Naaman's servants went to him and said, My father, if the prophet had told you to do some great thing, would you not have done it? How much more then when he tells you, wash and be cleansed? So he went down and dipped himself in the Jordan seven times, as the man of God had told him, and his flesh was restored and became clean like that of a young boy. Then Naaman and all his attendants went back to the man of God. He stood before him and said, Now I know that there is no God in all the world except in Israel. Please accept now a gift from your servant. Thank you. You may be seated. Heavenly Father, teach us this morning from this your word. This event happened a long time ago in a place not very close to here, and yet it's in the Bible for a reason. You want to teach us. It's something you want us to see. And so I pray, Lord, you'd open our minds and hearts so that we might indeed see what it is that you want us to see today, to understand and to allow your Holy Spirit to apply it in our lives. And so speak to us in these moments, I pray, in Christ's name, amen. Don't know if the name Gary S. Paxton means anything to any of you. Gary S. Paxton, he always insisted that the S be used when he was talked about, was a man who had an extremely tragic childhood and then ended up having tremendous success as a young adult. Those of you who are of my generation may remember a little song called The Monster Mash. Anybody remember Monster Mash? Oh, yeah, okay. He wrote that and produced it, along with a number of other hits of that era. And he became very successful as a sought-after composer and producer of 
pop music. Along with the success and the fame and the money came a, a restlessness in his soul. He indulged in just about everything he could find to try to plug the hole in his life that he couldn't quite decide what was. But he knew that there was an emptiness. And he knew that all of the fame and fortune and all of the stuff he was trying was not working. And at his lowest point, he figured, what else have I got to lose? And he stumbled into a church. That evening, he got saved. And he never took another drug or another drop of alcohol from that time forward. He dedicated himself to serving Jesus Christ, who had saved him, who had now given to him all of what he felt he needed all of those years, just didn't know what it was. He had been made whole. And so, until his death just two years ago at age 77, he was still ministering. He wrote a lot of Christian music in that time, worked with Bill and Gloria Gaither and others. His most famous song was called, He Was There All the Time, Speaking of God. And the chorus goes, he was there all the time, he was there all the time, waiting patiently in line, he was there all the time. This was his testimony. All the while he was searching for something, Jesus was waiting. And finally came the day when he found him. Interesting, when they asked Gary S. Paxton what his favorite song in the world is, he didn't choose one that he wrote. He said, my favorite song in the world is, I'd rather have Jesus. Gary S. Paxton learned and lived out an important truth. And that is, if you're looking for something, you need to go to the source of where that thing is. When I want to buy a suit, I don't go to Home Depot. When I need to buy a lawnmower, I don't go to Men's Warehouse. You go to where that thing that you need is, where you can get that which you need and desire. There are so many people in this world who are searching, like Gary S. Paxton did, for something. They may not even know what to call it, a sense of peace, maybe, fulfillment, purpose, meaning, healing, rootedness, forgiveness, identity. All they know is that nothing else satisfies, and there's something missing. I remember seeing an interview with Tom Brady after they won their first Super Bowl. And he, in that interview, basically said, you know, obviously the high point of his life to that point, right? And he said, I don't know, there's still something missing in my life. I just wanted to scream at the TV, I know what it is! I know who it is! And I keep praying that he'll find him. There's no shortage of people, programs, substances, philosophies, that all promise to fill that hole, to give us that which we need. And many people, like Gary S. Paxton, discover that they're all dead ends. They don't deliver what they're promised, and the emptiness remains. Gary S. Paxton represents those who finally discover their answer was in Jesus. This story in 2 Kings 5 is an interesting one. The account of Naaman. He's a man that also lived out that journey. That journey of seeking for something that he was looking for too often 
looking for it in all the wrong places, and finally finding it in God. As we read this story, we see that Naaman is a Syrian military hero. He had led many successful military raids for his king, including many over the nation of Israel, God's people. We read here in this passage that he's called a great man in the sight of his master. So he was obviously a favorite of the king. It says he was highly regarded. So he was respected as a great man. It says he was a valiant soldier. So he was virtuous and brave and courageous. He just had one problem. And it was a big one. It was a health issue. He had leprosy. Leprosy, as you know, is a debilitating disease. Back in those days, it would be terminal. Leprosy brought ostracism and stigma to anyone who had it. Here we have a man who, in one sense, has everything in the world, and yet... Now he's going to be shunned. Now he's not going to be given his due. His life is basically over because of this disease. All his worldly success, all his ingenuity, all his fame couldn't conquer that enemy. But he also had a spiritual issue, though I'm not sure he realized it at the time. But we see it as we go through the story. In an ironic twist, a servant girl of his wife, a girl who was captured by him in one of his raids, suggests that maybe he should go to Israel and see Elisha the prophet. She remembers that Elisha was able to do great miracles by the power of God working in him. She says, maybe, Naaman, you should go and check him out. So Naaman gets permission from the king to go. And you'll notice he gets a letter of introduction. And he also brings with him a boatload of money. One commentator I read suggests that in our day and age, basically he brought between one and two million dollars with him. And Naaman embarks on his quest for healing. And so we see the story unfolding. And at the end, what do we see? We see Naaman receives his healing. But he receives so much more than that. He also learned something. The same thing that Gary S. Paxton learned. The same thing that so many people have already learned and so many need to learn. A lesson in where to find Spiritual blessing. Where is the source? If you're looking for something in your spirit, where do you go? The lesson Naaman learned is there are some dead ends, but there's also one place to go in the end. Just take a look at the story and see if it mirrors how many in our world feel today. First, the dead-end sources. The first was wealth. I mentioned that Naaman brought great riches with him. Why did he bring all that money? Well, that's easy to figure. He's going to try to grease the wheels, maybe bribe the king, whatever it would take to get that which he wanted. Money talks, so the world believes. The truth is, in our world, it often does. Let's be honest. I'll never forget, when I was in seminary, my wife and I were looking for an apartment, and we applied with this fellow who was very well off and had a very big house and a lot of land, but on the periphery of the land was a little apartment building. I'm sure at one time it was the servants' quarters or something like that, that he was renting out, and we inquired as to it, and he liked us and said he would rent it to us at a recent, decent price. Problem is, somebody was already living in it at the time. 
And I said, well, well, what about those people? Are they going to be out in time? And I'll never forget what he said. He said, Dave, when you have money, you can do anything. And he firmly believed it. Money does make possible in our world many things. It's not wrong to have it. It's not wrong to use it. But one thing that it cannot do, it cannot buy the spiritual blessings that come only from God. If you place your ultimate trust in your wealth, then you're going to be disappointed. In fact, it may actually be a hindrance. Jesus warned several times, as you know, of the particular temptations that come with having much wealth. We even have an illustration in the book of Acts, a man named Simon Magus, who comes to Christ under the influence of Peter and John and the apostles, and he sees all the incredible miracles that they're doing, and he wants to be able to do those miracles. So he basically goes to Peter and John and says, how much money will it take for me to buy that ability from you? And Peter answers, may your money perish with you, because you thought you could buy the gift of God with money. Naaman didn't need to bring all that wealth with him. If he was trusting in that, that was just a dead end. Another dead end that we see in Naaman is that he put his faith in other people. Take a look. Who does Naaman go to for healing? The servant girl said, go to the prophet. Is that where he went? Not initially. <laughs> he went to the king. And the letter that was sent from his king said, so that you, king, might cure him of his leprosy. Why did he go to the king? You say, well, he needed permission. He's going through proper protocol. Okay, maybe. But I think there's something more going on here. The king is the most important person. He's the one with authority. He would be the one that you would go to if you needed something. The problem is earthly authority doesn't always ensure spiritual authority, does it? Just because you have a place of prestige and power doesn't mean that you have spiritual power as well. Thankfully, the king recognized this. He tears his robes and says, what are you asking me for? I can't do anything like that. But then Naaman goes to somebody else. He goes to Elijah, or at least he wanted to. Naaman thought Elijah could heal him. Elijah, Elijah knew that only God could heal him. And so when he comes, what does Elisha do? Greets him at the door? No. Runs out to meet him? No. He sends his servant to see him. And how does Naaman take that? He's angry, it says in the word. He's angry. He doesn't want to deal with a servant. He wants to deal with Elisha because Elisha's the one who has the power. His trust was in a man. And it proved to be a dead end. One more dead end is his own expectations. How did Naaman envision his healing would happen? What was in his head when he was on his way to see Elijah? What did he expect? He says what he'd expect. He, he expected. <laughs> he says that, well, Elisha would come out and he'd say the magic words, wave his hand, and instantaneously he would be healed. Abracadabra. Instead, Elisha sends his servant out and says, Go down to the Jordan River and wash yourself seven times. Naaman was not happy. That wasn't the method he wanted. He wanted instantaneous supernatural demonstration. He also didn't want to go to the Jordan River. Because the Jordan River is kind of a dirty, muddy river. And he says the rivers back home are so far better than that. 
In other words, he wanted healing, but he wanted it on his own terms. I get to decide how this is going to happen. And Elisha's message to him was basically, no, you don't. No, you don't. Those are the dead ends. Now, where is the source of blessing? It's obviously in God himself. Take a look at the instruments that God used. He used a captured servant girl. He used a foreign king. He used a prophet, but only at a distance. It was the prophet's servant who actually met with him. And he used a muddy river. Why did God do it that way? Couldn't God have just intervened miraculously at any point in the story and healed him? Sure he could have. Why this way? I believe it was because God was more interested in Naaman's spiritual healing than his physical healing. He did it this way to communicate a message to Naaman. It was a twofold message. One, I am God, I am the one who heals. And two, it is the humble and obedient that receive my blessing. Naaman had to be stripped of his pride, he had to be humbled in order to truly receive what God had for him. What is the thing that keeps people from God more than anything else? Is it not pride? I don't need God. I can do this on my own, or I can find somebody who will. Pride. And what you see in this passage is God knocking Naaman down, peg by peg, to help him understand that it's not what he wanted or what he thought was best, but it was by placing his trust in him. Going and doing something like washing yourself seven times in a muddy river was a test. Do you believe me, Naaman, or don't you? Are you willing to take me at my word or not? Are you still going to hold out to decide how you want things done? In other words, God was saying, you you need to accept me on my terms, not the other way around. The source of blessing for Naaman and for all of us is God himself. It's not in money, material possessions, wealth, bank accounts, stock portfolios. It's not in power and authority and prestige and position. It's not in any particular human being, no matter how virtuous they might be. The source of spiritual blessing is only in God. And as long as you're looking somewhere else, you won't find it. But if we're willing to humble ourselves, humble ourselves and Say, okay, God, your way. I come to you as the one who can bring healing. Naaman received his healing, but he received a whole lot more. He received a spiritual blessing as well, which is far more important. You notice what he said after the healing? Now I know that there is no God at all in all the world except in Israel. He understood that his problem was spiritual in nature. The leprosy was what was used to bring him to God. He learned the lesson as to where to go for spiritual blessings. So where do we go? What are we trusting in? When we need God's help, where do we go? 
Dottie Rambo years ago wrote a song that's been recorded by probably every gospel singer in the world. But she's right on with her lyrics. They go like this. Where do I go when there's nobody else to turn to? Who do I talk to when nobody wants to listen? Who do I lean on when there's no foundation stable? I go to the rock. I know he's able. I go to the rock. Where do I go when the storms of life are threatening? Who do I turn to when those winds of sorrow blow? Is there a refuge in the time of tribulation? I go to the rock. I know he's able. I go to the rock. I go to the rock for my salvation. I go to the stone that the builders rejected. I run to the mountain, and the mountain stands by me. When the earth all around me is sinking sand, on Christ the solid rock I stand. When I need a shelter, when I need a friend, I go to the rock. Where do you go? Let's pray. Remind us, Lord, that you have the answers. You have what we need. You have all the things that this world cannot provide. Help us, Lord, not to place our trust in sand. Help us not to travel down dead ends looking for what we may not even know we need. Remind us, Lord, to go to you, always, you above all others, you forever. And thank you that when we do, you meet us and you heal us. In Jesus' name I pray, amen.